Today's podcast is brought to you by Horizons Resolve Adaptive Asset Allocation ETF, which trades on the Toronto Stock Exchange under the ticker symbol HRAA and is sub-advised by Resolve Asset Management. HRAA is an alternative fund whose investment objective is to seek long-term capital appreciation by investing, directly or indirectly, in major global asset classes, including, but not limited to, equity indices, fixed income indices, interest rates, commodities, and currencies. HRAA gains exposure to these asset classes by investing in derivative instruments that may include future contracts and forward agreements and securities. HRAA will take long or short positions, using up to a maximum of three times leverage in asset classes such as equity indices and fixed income asset classes. To learn more about this, please visit www.horizonsetfs.com HRAA to read about the ETF's investment objectives and important disclaimers about the risks associated with an investment in the ETF. All right, so welcome, Razvan Remsing. Razvan, maybe tell us a little bit about yourself and Aspect Capital and what you do there. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Very excited to be on your show. Um, so I'm based in London. I work for Aspect Capital. I'm a director of investment solutions there. Uh, first of all, you know, Aspect is a systematic investment manager. We pretty much trade anything that moves and is sort of a future forward type of derivative strategies, spanning CTA, global macro, short term. Um, and we've been around for a number of, you know, a good amount of time, founded in 1998 from, from very good pedigree. Our founders were um, founding members of, of AHL back in the day, so early pioneers in systematic futures trading and what i do there as as uh, part of the investment solutions group is really uh, be part of the product development research functions at aspect we um, i sit on the product design group and we really just provide our clients with uh, quantitative expertise on relating to our strategies our products performance research and you know, this is really where, as a systematic manager, I would say maybe it's more like the voice of the machine, you know, being able to relay what we're thinking in quant land to what it actually means to our clients' portfolios. And um, so I've been doing that since 2010. So what does that mean in practical terms, like day to day? Um, I'm actually really curious about the communications dimension to this because we spend a lot of time trying to think about how to communicate the salient characteristics of, of our strategies to clients. And so much of it is, I mean, clients are bombarded with stuff like we're positioned here or here, here's where our risk budgets are. Here's our um, current expected shortfall daily, weekly, et cetera. Um, I always, I always wonder how are the clients using these pieces of information, right? I mean, it's it's not as though more information is always more useful, right? So how, you, how do you guys think about that problem in communicating the, the salient characteristics of what's going on in strategies to clients in a way that is meaningful for them? Look, I think you you hit the nail on the head there. It, it's not about volume of, of information. It's about the right balance, the right nature of information, the right time of it. So we we spend a lot of, I guess the majority of our work is pre-investment. Uh, it's really, that's where you set the, the, the scene for what clients should expect, what the strategies really are designed to do, what the utilities are, what their challenges are. So we, we spend a lot of time explaining what we expect to see from these strategies and also how to, you know, we, we try to help our clients place these 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 strategies in their portfolios because really gone are the days of of just allocating to you know you know 20 hedge fund strategies you don't worry too much about what they do and how they work together so it's really all about helping our clients achieve that portfolio balance they want and so that work is done up front and it's it's it involves anything from bespoke presentations um doing um, on sites with them, what we used to be able to do, but we still do that virtually. And teasing out 
what it is that they expect from us, what they understand, and then making sure they have that intuition. And then we set up reporting and touch points on an ongoing basis that is appropriate to them. And, you know, for some some clients, you know, they, they outsource their um, data capturing to a third-party provider. So that it, may, it may mean a simple case as, as making sure that provider has access to the positions and the risk metrics and whatever is suitable. What we try to do as a, as a team and as a, as a firm is remain involved in that conversation. So we have regular update calls with the stakeholders, the people that need to continue to understand the strategy. And then that that's, again, it's, it's, there's no, there's no magic way to do it. It's about being appropriate. And so in the teeth of the crisis last year, um, you know, we, we were basically in touch with the clients as they wanted it. Um, you know, not necessarily having presentations, but just drilling into our systems, giving them the information they needed. When things settled down, then we wrote a few pieces and we, you know, we have a bit of time to, um, to put our thoughts together on paper and, and, and make it a more, um, sort of a generic or general explanation as to what's happening to our systems. So, so those are the, the, the ways we do it, but I'm sure there are other ways of, of, of getting around the problem of making sure people understand what it is that you do. So does that involve sometimes um, real-time type information, dashboards that you create, either custom dashboards for individual clients or, or more sort of general dashboards that you offer to, to, to many clients? So it does. Um, we have a whole set of systems that are clear that are internal to us and you know it has information right down to how the signals behave and and what data goes into those signals we utilize parts of that system to show clients that transparency we we don't really allow that information to so to speak leave the building but in the context of meetings uh, online calls access we we can dive into right into the nitty-gritty of, of what's driving a particular effect and that's very useful and Razin, when you when you talk about communicating that particular effect I think you know back in, in the traditional world when you're talking about for example value investing uh, and you're looking at stocks you can show a very clear aspect of the particular companies that make them a, a value investment that's worth putting money into and they the investor can conceptualize it and you're off to the races when it comes to quantitative investing, like you're showing them something, but what is it that you are showing them, can show them, and how is it received by your constituent uh, investors? Again, it's it's we're showing the type of information that hopefully ties up with the intuition we've built for them. But clearly, the the biggest challenge I would say for systematic investing, from a client point of view, is this sort of this concept that it's a black box right yeah. they, they think well there's no possible way you're going to show me a thousand lines and they're all going to be flashing some are going some are squiggly some are zigzaggy others come on and off it could be anything and the challenge we have is to educate the investor the client as to what are the right inputs for our strategies how can you observe that in the real world? So say, you know, it's simple stuff, momentum. That's the easiest one because you, you're you looking at a, a price chart as a starting point and you say, is it going up or is it going down? And then you sort of, you tease out the necessary things that say, well, it's not just about the price. There's, there's other elements to it. And you can drill down to, you decompose that price action into the necessary constituents. And then you walk them through that process, you build it back up and you say, right, so that's those are the, the three main things that matter for this position. And and, and so it's it's an educational challenge as much as a, a one of, of displaying things accurately. And as you say, momentum is something that many people find very intuitive and easy to sort of reach out and, and touch. But as you 
move into less familiar features or variables and nonlinear types of relationships. Obviously, those intuitions get more ephemeral. Um, so how do you build intuition for strategies that are less intuitive? So those that maybe use alternative data sources or or and or um, nonlinear types of relationships. We always find that to be an interesting struggle and, and challenge. And, and um, so uh, this is a very real challenge, I think, generally for the for the systematic industry i'm just i'm interested in your perspective on it yeah it's um you know it, it's it's important to break things down to their um hypotheses so, so you always start every single model every single idea that we do is rooted in some observable effect and you have to be able to translate that into into words you know so you know something like I'm going to use flow data. What does that mean? So that's an alternative data set. It's 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 basically allowing me to to track the collective actions of investors. So I'm able to observe what a group of investors is doing by allocating resources, funds from one type of investment vehicle to another. It's called an ETF, so whatever. And that idea is quite simple to explain. So we're trying to understand what is an aggregate investor doing over a particular time frame. How you get that then translated from simple idea into a real time model, that's what we do. But I don't think it's it's meant to be that difficult. If it is too difficult to explain, it's probably too complex or too fitted or quite likely, well, I wouldn't go as far as spurious, but it shouldn't be that difficult to explain the essence of a model. Okay. So uh, clearly being able to work on this type of communication is the main aspect, very quite successful. I'm curious to hear, what do you think? It's a very competitive world. And we always say internally that, that investing is the most competitive landscape on the planet. So what do you think has made Aspect successful uh, or, or, you know, be able to survive as long as it has? I think it's, I mean, communication is one thing, but it's ultimately, we're a performance driven firm. We have to perform for our clients and we have to do so in a, I think I've used this word before, but intuitive manner. So what we've done well over the years has been create resilient strategies that we have explained well. And it's about being able to manage those expectations. And, you know, for us, we have multiple investment horizons. Our, our client base is predominantly institutional. And the idea is to make sure that whatever it is that we put together as a product stays style pure within that that um, uh, line of work for as long as it needs to and, and sort of once you start to tinker with the the nature of the product is it, that that's where I find is the most difficult thing to explain to clients they might be disappointed but they shouldn't be surprised by your performance and you know, it's been a long time. We've been you know, over 20 years of, of, of track record at Aspect. Some really, really strong performance in some really challenging times. And also some challenging performance um, at other times. But it, it's always been about being upfront, being clear, and having set the right expectations up front. That really helps. So last year was obviously an especially interesting year. Um, for everyone, but I think perhaps um, even more for systematic strategies. Um, how did you find calendar 2020? Um, and, and can you articulate any sort of lessons learned over the year? Absolutely. I think it's a, it's a 
I think it's going to be one of these years that we're going to study for many, many to come. Um, I heard some joke. Somebody said that in decades to come, economists will specialize in the first half of 2020 or the second half of 2020. Um, but really, in terms of um, how we fed, you know, I think we've really delivered very strong performance for our clients. We've had a good mix of um, useful returns. So our directional strategies. So let me give you a sense of the type of things that we we, we span. Um, actually, you know, we, we've got probably two to three hundred different types of models across the firm that we apply to sort of the most liquid financial futures and, and, and commodity markets. I could group them into probably directional strategies at one one end. And those those are sort of spanning short term effects from one to two days right up to six to nine months. So quite a, a spectrum of from short term, medium term to uh, some would say long term. And then we have another family of, of models and themes that are more relative value in nature, cross-sectional in nature. And as it happens, those also span quite a range of frequencies, but we have a lot of them are quite short term in nature. And we have some slow moving relative value effects. And this is cross asset could be, you know, commodity relative term structures. It doesn't have to be, um, you know, just stocks and bonds. The first thing that I would say is that speed was the most important discriminant, the most important factor that describes performance over 2020. The faster models definitely had much better chance with this acceler. Everything was accelerated last year. Uh, we condensed almost like a business cycle in eight months. We, we, you know, we, we've all seen, we've read the news, we've, we've lived through it, but um, at the relative value spectrum or the sort of the cross-sectional models, there you definitely had to be fast. So I think in the directional sense, you could get away with being a bit slower in fixed income. Um, you had to be quick in risk assets because that's really the, where the risk shock happened. Whereas in if you're doing things in a relative value way where you're hoping for correlations to hold or you're hoping for this perceived um, diversification to hold, that's where speed was of the essence. And so we found things like forward-looking data sets, alternative data sets, anything that was capturing sentiment or um, flows, things like that were much, much more useful than more slower moving economic fundamental type models. Um, across the spectrum, I would say our directional trend following models handled Q1 very well. Then they got um, affected by the big, big, big reversal in risk assets. And then we saw, I think the best family of models that I would kind of say is would be flows and then followed by sentiment. And with sentiment, again, we have a mix of quite a lot of alt data sets. So what is sentiment? To us, it's any type of information that signals investor intent. So it could be outright um, NLP models that are looking at what people are writing on blogs and about their views on G10 currencies, or it could be looking further on the term structure of futures curves. We can actually see what, what's, what's coming down the line based on, on, on real money being put down on, on sort of in further and further expiries. We might be looking at option surface data to 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 see uh, disruptions there because you know when you're looking at where the real money is actually being placed, that's a much solid, more solid source of information than surveys. You know, because surveys is one thing. Like we've seen what polls do with with, with elections, 
right? It's, it's, it, it really matters when you put your money down. And so we, we're trying to harvest these, these um, bits of information. And if you do that quickly, it helps. If you do it slowly, you miss sharp edged effects like, like we saw. So just, I wanna understand when you're talking about sentiment, you talked about flows. How much of those indicators go into directionality calls and how much is risk management of the, of the portfolio exposure? So almost all of it goes into generating signals. Um, there are certain sort of, it's more volatility based measures. Sort of when you're trying to, reass to assess the, the short term risk of a particular, you know, and risk again has many different definitions, but when you're looking at a very liquid, liquid assets in the short term, vaults a pretty good measure of telling you what's the chance of getting that, that price that you want. And for us, we, we treat that metric as more the, the risk sizing, the risk scaling, the risk um, awareness comes through those metrics of course we look at cds's we look at other other measures of, of of implied risk but when it comes to utilizing sentiment and flow data or any other themes that's to generate signals on assets that we trade in some cases those signals are directional in other cases they might be uh, cross-sectional you might care about you know you have more directionality view on a particular asset class or, or family of models but you do care about the relative effect we see a lot of models have uh, very particular characteristics that make them thrive in certain environments. Now, you mentioned flows and uh, sentiment as being very good for 2020. What type of periods make them do really poorly in contrast to some of the other strategies? Or if, is there a theme to it? I think it's more that the more established long-term persistent themes are more disrupted so these things tend to have more of an edge when you have a lot of um, conflicting views so i wouldn't necessarily say that i expect flow information to always have very strong um, traction i wouldn't expect necessarily to to uh, be completely wrong because i think it it we're trying to build models that that capture aggregate investor behavior. We do believe that there's, there's a lot of inbuilt biases in the way we all collectively behave. And I think that that's one of the keys of systematic investing. We're trying to find some of these biases and try to design something that at least is not biased in that particular respect. Because I'm sure we all have our biases, even if, if you... Um, you know, as long as humans build algos, they will be biased. Um, but you know, there, there are certain effects that we believe are persistent, but over very long time frames. And even though you know, I, I say to you, well, twenty twenty is just one year. What's actually been all the exciting stuff happened in the space of a handful of weeks uh, in, in, in patches last year. So that's not really a enough. To, to, to discount the validity of other types of models, but you, that's why you need to have lots of them, lots of different types of models to be able to navigate a lot of these unseen environments. How important is it to be able to have conditional models? So models that identify that you're in a certain type of environment and therefore that that sig signal strength is likely to be um, more salient in this environment than in uh, under different conditions is that something that you spend some time on absolutely it's a it's a very rich vein of of research and it has traction on in many investment um styles i don't think it's universally you know that that everything needs to be conditioned it depends on the nature of the effect so it all boils back down to having a hypothesis about what you're trying to do, trying to capture. And if that hypothesis says, well, I expect certain macro conditions to be favorable 
to this hypothesis playing out and others not so much, um, then a conditional model is the way to go. So a, a simple example here would be carry strategies. Right? Carry's had a fantastically um, you know, wide usage across the industry. It's, it's, it's a big driving force of a lot of price action. But carry is an incredibly left-tailed um, strategy. It's, it's you make a dollar, you make a dollar, you make another dollar, and every now and then you lose 10. So, but carry is a risk-seeking strategy. It's, it's something that people care about carry when they have positive risk appetite. No one cares about interest rate differentials when the world's on fire. So, whilst it's very hard to time when to be short carry, there's a lot more traction one can get from just knowing when to just not play carry. So, you know, we spend time looking for, you know, indicators that give us you know, can we try to forecast risk aversion? And we can do that in many asset classes. You can do it by country, you can do it by by asset class. Again, with, with a great degree of, of uncertainty, but if you don't have too many false positives and you're not constantly switching on and off, and you're just incurring transaction costs for no reason, better safe than sorry, and you end up catching one or two of those big events that you avoid, and, and it, it pays for itself, um, so that that sort of approach is is useful, especially when you're doing faster strategies. Because you, with faster strategies, that if you're wrong, you can be wrong frequently, so you can bleed quite quickly. Whereas in the slower strategies, I think there are other challenges. The challenges are that you you you, you know, let's go back to trend where you think well. The worst thing can happen to a slow moving trend model is that the world changes and stays changed for a number of months and you just position the wrong way. But you can mitigate against that differently. Um, you could just, that's position sizing, you can, you can size your position quite quickly and still be the wrong side of that trade. And then sort of gives you that stability. You might, you might find it's a correction, it might be a, a retracement and the trend resumes. So then you start from a better place. but. You don't have to condition out entirely. Speaking of conditionality, I mean, as you say, 2020 provides um, such a, a rich tapestry of conditions, right? Um, and I, I think it highlights the fact that really major events can sometimes completely dominate a data set and and corrupt the way that you interpret conclusions and relationships in the data how do you guys think about that and and maneuver around it so that's a very important um observation uh you know that there are i think the nature of doing systematic it's not to say that discretionary managers aren't data driven of course they are but the you know, if, if I was running a discretionary strategy and I was looking at 2020, I'd say, like, right, so those three weeks in March, we know what happened. We kind of, let, let's let's be forward-looking. Let's, let's sort of adapt our models. Let's look at what's happening right now, what it matters. I wouldn't necessarily keep in my data set or necessarily be as sensitive to the size of those observations you had in March. Um, what's important to realize is that you have to detangle the risk side of a big price move versus the information it carries to forecast subsequent states of the world. And we found, you know, this this effect is something that we've already noticed and sort of traded around by, by when we look at at financial assets versus commodity assets. There, there seems to be a initially a, a counterintuitive effect is observed, namely that when you have very large single day moves in price, 
generally what happens is if it's a commodity asset, more often than not, that initial move in price is actually quite correct. So the commodity players seem to get that um, bit of exogenous information right. Whereas the financial guys tend to overdo it and the true sort of impact of that bit of information only comes out a bit later. And so initially, if you think of it like that, it doesn't quite make sense. It's not, it can't be that the financial guys just can't really understand an exogenous move or exogenous shock. I think what it comes down to is financial system is a lot more complex, a lot more interlinked. So when a central banker or a policymaker stands up and says they might be doing some change to policy, maybe significant change to policy at some time in the future, unknown amount, but maybe quite significant, that has big, big, big bearing on many, many assets. We just don't quite know how much, when, how. Whereas when a, a flood or a refinery goes into outage or you have a, a pest that attacks a, a crop, it's fairly clear what happens to the supply and demand for that commodity. And so the informational content is cleaner in commodity assets. So we already sort of treat those big single day moves differently in our data sets, depending where it comes from. And I think an observation about 2020 is to do the same for the observations, those peak risk moves that we saw in March, April. Um, and the question is, how informative are those globally heightened risk states for for future, for, for sizing your portfolios, sizing your views. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very, very important thing to address. And it's not something that has an easy answer. We're still looking into it, put it that way. Well, what's interesting about it, or one of the things that's interesting about it is that, well, for example, March, all the excitement played out over a horizon that is measured in at most weeks. So as a fraction of the total data set, it's actually a very small number of observations as a percentage of the total number of observations in the data. So it wouldn't have uh, such an, outsor an outsized impact on um, statistical conclusions using certain types of metrics, but using other types of metrics, it would exhibit a profoundly outsized impact on the target functions and so i guess some of it some some of this challenge can be ameliorated by shifting or having a, a wider variety of different objective functions um as you're identifying the nature of relationships um and then because i mean i guess as data scientists you try to avoid introducing degrees of freedom, right? And, and if you're, if you are making an explicit um, decision to de-emphasize or emphasize certain periods, then that introduces a very important degree of freedom that then needs to be managed and tested for sensitivity, et cetera. So to the extent that you can, you can um, navigate around this, this challenge, um, systematically without with, with without having to make a, a large number of other decisions and i think that's that's preferable how, how do you guys think through that i think that's the the crux of the matter it's that's what research is about i think you know there is there is knee-jerk reaction and there is research driven chain evolution to your models and in almost all cases having a range of approaches, having a range of um, ideas that you combine tends to, as long as they're unfitted. So I think for us, our biggest, biggest focus is on 
creating strategies and models that it might sound crazy at first, but they don't they're not your best sharp best information ratio in sample, right? We're not going to choose the things that just look the best because you know you can what they need to do is they need to be very robust on their parameter choices. Um, they just need to have a decent amount of sharp and and really just what we focus on is having uncorrelated data sources, uncorrelated approaches, whether it's by time frames or by directionality by asset class, because that's your really your your only way that you can half hope that you will have a handful of these models perform in unseen environments whilst others um naturally falter there is you know i think we're very um aware that you know certain things change so the way the market dynamics play out the the access points the way certain um venues trade so the way liquidity appears but certain things are are highly highly static in terms of and that's our behavior. So what we're trying to do, we're trying to balance. We're looking for long-term effects. Even in the short-term space, we're looking for something that's there. And I'm going to jump a bit to, uh, sort of I remembered a link to alt data sets. And that's one of the biggest challenges to alt data sets. They're quite new. So it takes a bit of time to be able to get the confidence that there is something there. So there's no shortage of alt data set providers and salesmen and and so there's no shortage of that, but there's shortage of falsifiable or, or of having the ability to to understand is there traction in this data set. So you know we it's not to so we use alt, alt data, but it's not a huge amount of what we do, right? It happens to perform well, but we have to keep researching it, and we have to always tie it back to to things we un to relationships we understand. So the, the the starting point is, I wonder if we could find a way to to sort of to get data on this effect, and and you know you're able to, you know, the hypothesis could be the same. So we're trying to forecast inflation, and we're trying to forecast the relationship between bonds and inflation. That's a very simple straightforward one inflation rising inflation bad for bonds right there's no denying that but the question is where do you look for this inflation do you look for it um, you know how do you forecast things that could eventually turn out into inflation expectations and that's the game but you, you have to always be grounded you have, to have some some you have to have some view of the world and and then try to build something that captures that view and risk manages the failure case. And then you repeat. So backing away from the alt data, which you've acknowledged is, um, I, I mean, by virtue of it being new, um, we just know less about it. Um, how do you interpret the special challenges that were experienced by traditional sort of alt style premia type funds over the last two or three years. Do you guys have an internal thesis on that? And and what does that, if, if you have one, what does that thesis imply about expectations for these types of strategies going forward, do you think? So we've got some thoughts on the, on the topic and we, we have a, we run some alt Alt Premia strategies ourselves. Um, incidentally, they we've got two versions: one that trades with cash equities in it, so basically futures, forwards, derivatives, and cash equities, and one without. One is just the sort of the CTA markets. The one doing the CTA markets, which has very little momentum in it, but still just the futures and forwards broadly flat on the year. So it performed really, really well last year. The one with cash equities in it um, was a little bit down, but again, significantly ahead of industry benchmarks. And so it was for us, 
we had to look into it because you have to you have to look into it a lot when you underperform and when you outperform because clearly a benchmark is is there as a guidance for I mean, either you you're not part of that peer group or you've done something really really well or really lucky or unlucky and i think what we've i'll tell you what where we've done well and then sort of try and back out where i think the challenges are and what it means we've done well by only taking not taking a lazy equity beta in that in that program so we i think it's it's a, it's a observation we made and it's it stems back to our client base people have got equity and bond beta for free that's what they're sitting on that's what they're trying to diversify away and so if you build a you know if you build a program alt risk premia is maybe 10 years ago was quantum multi strat it's just basically it, it's it's the, the the space has evolved so that these are well understood repeatable liquid factors and one way to make those strategies perform really well over the last 10 years is to just throw in a bit of equity beta, maybe throw in a bit of short vol, because that again, just harvest that premium. It's good negative carry there. Um, for us, that felt like it wasn't diversifying enough. And then that's, that's so we were very aware of, of the types of risks we're taking. So that program that we have is not entirely market neutral, nor is it entirely directional. So it's actually a, a blend of the two and it is an optimizer that picks at any point in time the balance of whatever the signals are, are strong in which in which um, asset class. And, you know, we do trade volatility effects, but we, we, we go short and long as well. So the strategy was able to... You know, we started... 2020 being short vol. But the beautiful thing about doing this multi-asset style is that equity markets were the last ones to crash, to to, 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 to react, to, to realize that something was sinister was, was, was going around. I mean, the way the Chinese clamped down on, on their economy, um, oil was in, in a bear market by the end of January already. So there were a lot of signals out there that risk was was picking up and that you know being able to identify that and at at best go long vol at worst just at least get out of the way helps so we've seen a couple of you know videos and and commentaries from from some firms bemoaning the fact that Short vol just really, you know, expanded eightfold in the space of a month, which never happened before. And so that that to us was was a big, big differentiator. Another one was how much you load up on traditional equity value factors. So that's I'm I, you know, I'm not going to spend any airtime on on equity value anymore. I think there's, there's there's better places, and it's been it's a topic that's been well discussed. But how much of that you put in your portfolio? is a big differentiator. And then speed. I mentioned speed at the beginning of this uh, discussion. The slower you go, especially in the most traditional factors, the less likely you are to pick up the fact that the world's changed twice. A big shock and then actually bigger stimulus known to man. And and we're looking through that. So you could be wrong twice. And so, you, so, so those, those things means that the ultra premium space is going to go through a a period of being revisited by all those that have allocated and they're going to reassess what it is that we expected from this group of strategies um, i think there will be I mean, we're starting to see this effect with with the the people we talk to, that there is a big drive for allocators to build their own combination of art risk premiums. They, they, they'll now decide which risk premium they believe in, rather than just giving me like 200 plus effects that I can't detangle. 
we're going to decide if we want value, we want carry, we want momentum, do we want vol, do we want, you know, whatever it is that we want, and then we're going to go source it. So some of the biggest allocators are still thinking along these lines, but they're being a lot more tailored with how they're going to allocate. So, Raz, so you- does that mean that they are coming to firms like yours and saying, we'd like you to build us a bespoke um, product that includes exposures to these, or they come to you to consult on, um, you know, if you were to build a bespoke model that has these characteristics, what would you include? What would it look like? Are you having more of those types of conversations so that there's less... I'm just allocating to a handful of big global alt style premium products and more. I'd like to consult with top names in the business on um, how to create the exact right bespoke alt premium exposures for us. So there's a, I mean, the answer to that is depends on the size of the and sophistication of the allocator, right? It's not, I mean, I think, Many might desire to do that, but not everyone has got the in-house capability to to handle that portfolio construction stage or the complexity of, of you know, so, yes, but the biggest allocators, the ones that have the resources and the investment teams in-house that are skilled and able to do this are absolutely doing this. So we, you know, the biggest amount of work that I spend my time on is on bespoke, you know, hence investment solutions, right? That's what this is really. You you talk about tailoring what we have with what they need and deciding what is the, what makes most sense. And, you know, we try to stay true to the integrity of the product so that that needs to be, that there's certain things that you can't break up. You know, you, you need, you, some strategies need to be alongside each other. They, you wouldn't have one without the other. But generally speaking, the majority of our large clients allocate to more than one of our strategies. And it's it's, this, it's not really just our Rusprina space. It's across the liquid alt space. The other end of the spectrum where we do have investors that completely understand the inefficiency of of um, one size fits all, but they, their challenges are: well, if I've only got a limited amount of capital and I can't, I can't be tailored. I can't talk to the top names, or I can't talk. I can't get bespoke solutions of exactly what I want. Then we're looking for things that are very, very complementary to a lot of traditional asset classes and factors. So things that you could maybe buy in an ETF form or you might have things that you already have a legacy holdings in and you like them, you had a you know got a good deal, you got an early, you're probably gonna stay in that particular manager. So those guys do want that that's where you want the broadest ultra spring program you can have. But that market is that that's one I think is the most challenged market because that that's where people allocated there begrudgingly, potentially. It wasn't their first choice, but it was a compromised choice, and now it's been underperformance for a number of years. So for us, it's about focusing on institutional clients that understand what they need and working with them um, to create these solutions. So, Razvan, how so much of what, that... What trends are you seeing? Oh, sorry, Rodrigo, go ahead. Yeah, so let me just ask questions about size here, because how much of that underperformance that we see in the all premium space, not just in 2020... But 2019, 2018, do you think has come from overexposure to value, um, you know, maybe improper construction of the portfolio? And how much is it because there's too much money chasing those particular strategies? I mean, the, the space has grown quite significantly over the last three years. I don't think it's a size issue. Um, not on these strategies. May, may, maybe there are a couple of maybe some some fringe, so-called inverted commas factors that maybe shouldn't be there. But the the bulk of these factors should be able to handle trillions of dollars, right? If you tell me that momentum, value, carry, you know, the the concept that buying something cheap, holding it for a decent amount of time and then letting it go later, or that behavioral driven momentum doesn't hold in size 
So, so those are things that should not be really affected by size. But then it depends how deep you sort of allocate. If you start going to single name equities and you start being, you know, too big a part of a particular cash equity, then 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 maybe you could start to see capacity problems there. We like to stick to generally to the, the most liquid futures to capture the, the macro um, effect. But I think it's just got to do with with speed and and um, I mean value's got a existential um, question mark over it. But it's also it's it's a low sharp strategy, right? It can go. It's still as much as we're not a value house. We we have hardly any value, but I still don't feel that value's broken, right? It's 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 resting. It's 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 very tired. It's it's but it's it's not broken. It's it's it is a evidence of a low sharp strategy that has a long holding period. Right. And we'll see. I mean, this this current level of disconnect in, I was going to say that sort of equity markets have been the ones that have behaved the most oddly in this crisis out of all asset classes. They've got the biggest strangeness about them. And so it's unsurprising that value, which requires some sensibility to prevail anchor and then that's been removed for some time Mm -hmm. and will it be gone forever it's quite hard to make that call so just sticking to that the the capacity part of things you talk about speed being an important component here of course the faster you go the more money you have to turn over and i imagine that there are some capacity issues with faster moving strategies how do you guys deal with that given that you're you're facing institutions for the most part? And I imagine large ones at that. Yeah, you're right. I mean you can't <clears throat> you know, you can't um, do very quick momentum or very quick value in size. Um, I think that that's what needs to be understood by many that there are lots of examples of strategies that have incredible sharp ratios. But you can only run like twenty million dollars in it, and it's and it's done. So we need to be very, very careful. So capacity utilization is very, very important. Um, we know we've got experience in that space. We've been a large CTA for a long period of time, and you can see it. You can pick it up. Um, you know the. You can pick it up when you're starting to be too big for that particular venue. So we a lot of our strategies are designed to with fairly strict constraints on how much open interest, how much average daily volume they can consume when they have peak positions. So you're trying to make sure that you can do your worst, your fastest, most important trade without being too big a part of the market. And that sort of sets the capacity and therefore that limits a little bit the the size of solution or the type of solution one can offer to a huge investor versus a medium-sized investor. And that's why I think for the largest allocators, the prospect of what's coming next for the next five, 10 years, where you might have low growth, maybe a bit of inflation, dare I say stagflation is not a, it's a non-zero probability when you've got that pool of assets and you're not getting any return from your bonds or from your equities that you need, how do you diversify? So I think that is the, you know, for us as a firm is one of the the things that we are focusing on coming up with ideas, solutions for that eventuality. However, knowing that it might not happen. So we need to, f- to come up with things that can survive then inflation not coming back as much as it as much as everybody thinks well not everybody thinks but there's there's a big body of of, of economists of commentators that say look short term deflationary medium to long term inflation's got to come back somehow and if it does it could be quite damaging to the bigger players because if you're a small allocator, if you're a small investor, you can be nimble, you can turn your book around, 
you can capture those things, but not for the big allocators. And that's something that we, we sort of we stay in quite hot on. So I'd love to stay with that thread, actually, the idea of um, what to do with equity in bond markets. And, and perhaps bonds are the place to focus because it's just such an obvious um, challenge where all of the higher frequency, high granularity data that we have for bond markets um, has m has manifested during one, essentially one single major long-term bond regime, this disinflationary growth environment that we've had since the early 80s. So how do you engineer strategies on assets that have such persistent long-term drift and where the where the underlying assets on their own have such an astonishingly large sharp ratio just as a as buy and hold i, I don't you, you can't you can't say the same thing about most equity markets but certainly in bonds that i think is the one of the most interesting challenges for systematic managers who are looking ahead to the potential for inflation to shift the underlying mechanics and dynamics of those markets. How do you, how are you guys thinking about that? Um, it's a fantastic challenge. It's, it's something that we've been grappling with for a good number of years. Um, actually, you know, this, this, this brings it back to the idea of bias, right? There is bias in this data, you know, we have since bond futures have been around, like you said, since the 80s, it's been generally a persistent lowering of yields. And when, you, when you're doing systematic futures investing, trend following global macro type things, the term structure effects that the shape of that yield curve is such a persistent force. So even if spot rates don't move, which they haven't, so they haven't moved for by and large, very much since the GFC. I mean, well, we've had, I mean, I, I you understand what I mean? Um, they've been low and stable, generally rates, yet huge amount of, of, of carry. Um, that presents a bit of a, you can fake out your models, right? Because if you're using only that data, then you end up believing that, well, actually bonds are your natural crisis hedge, right? So if you it's full, bonds will be there to help, help you. And they have done that recently, but it's correlation between stocks and bonds that's been negative and so useful. It's not there. It's, it's not a fundamental law of the universe that has to be held. In fact, with a little bit of inflation coming back, you probably looking at positive correlation in stocks and bonds. And so what we're trying to do is after the GFC, we had that, that first collapse in yields that are really aggressive and it was across the board. And we were toying, well, we, the market participants were wondering what happens when yields get to zero? Like what's going to happen? Is it a is it a, is it a bound is it a boundary is it can they go through zero and we laugh at that now but you know 2011 2012 there was just really a handful of excursions below zero and if we think that when you're looking at futures prices they sort of price inverse to to yield so you you, you sort of you the question is once the yields get close to zero, what's the upside left in that future? So does it make sense to hold a long position in a future market that's approaching zero? We did some studies then and, you know, how do you systematically handle these things, right? You've not seen this before. What's the, what's the way around? One of the results that came out is that the level of the yield has absolutely no bearing on how trendy a market is. What really matters is how volatile that yield is. In other words, are participants expressing an opinion 
are they using it to trade? Are they using it? And that, that creates that volatility. If that volatility dies away, that means that the market has walked away and it's just sitting on whatever the bound is set by the central bank, whatever the, and in some countries that bound is 2%, in other countries now we've seen is significantly negative. So we've already adapted our systems to be able to, to look at measures that show us that that market is still being actively traded and worrying less about the yields. Now, on a forward-looking basis, the other thing that we need to worry about is, is your first point, Adam, about don't bake into your systems the fact that bonds will be there to rescue you. So we don't rely on those correlations to hold. So our models are not predicated on a certain level of correlation between stocks and bonds or commodities and bonds. It allows them to be quite free-moving and, and therefore reactive. And then secondly, I mentioned that term structure and spot information can be quite different for, for um, fixed income instruments. You, you can have long periods of the spot markets doing nothing, and yet the futures contract is actually trending because the carry effect is so big. So we actually separate those effects out in our systems and we treat them differently. So therefore we're able to to react to changes in term structure, in carry, in the shape of the yield curve, as well as in the general drift of that, that entire yield curve. So that allows us to actually go significantly short fixed income as and when um, that, that um, event occurs. And of course, in a back test, the more unresponsive, sort of the, the more you strip out these biases, the worse your sim looks. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so what you have to do is you have to decide what is the simulation for? Is it for me to show you how great I could have been in the bond massacre of 1994 if I knew everything I know now? Or how do I handle a future change in fixed income? And that's what so we're building things for to work in the future. And so we're trying to strip out as much of these, these effects as possible while still being aware that um, you know, these markets are being traded by others. This is, you know, so there is a, this, this flow information or cross asset information is useful. So you can actually infer sentiment from other investors, but your more directional models should be pretty unbiased. So what's on the radar for Aspect um, over the next year or two? What do you see as the core areas of focus where the real potential opportunity lies, do you think? So it's actually more of the same, really. It's um, being able to to answer this, this to, to fill the void for allocators. I think they're looking for liquid solutions. So let me start again. If you've got a big pool of assets, you're sitting on equities and bonds, we've had a golden period for, for these asset classes. We've had, you know, a push for alternatives. And evidence is that the liquid alternatives have somewhat underwhelmed over the last 10 years because actually a lot of the industry has been aware of not baking in betas and, and you know trying to diversify away from this one ridiculous um, trend and then there's been the private equity markets the, sort of the private markets so you know these big allocators are sitting on as much illiquidity as they can whatever their mandate allows them they've got that um and now we are looking, you know, they continue to see, okay, what, what do we do? Because we can't turn the ship around quickly. We can't, if this inflation does come back, a lot of these institutions are heavily underfunded. So they're chasing quite high return, re required rates of return. They need liquid diversifying solutions. And we are working with them 
we're working, coming up with strategies that we can deploy that are resilient. So in other words, they, they, they will stay liquid, they will be able to protect your capital and they will deliver certain properties for that, for that investor. So we are building out capability with the firm. We're increasing our technology platform to be able to handle more and more customization and to make things bespoke. Um, it's, it's, you know, work more on all data sets, risk management, trading. It's the same thing we've been doing for the last, you know, 20 years. You, you, you keep doing the same thing, but we're trying to stay in the conversation with the big allocators because what we've noted is a big change between how many line items are currently held in a, in a institutional portfolio. So you, gone are the days of have as many hedge funds as you possibly can. What we are seeing is there's a big drive to consolidate and to do more with a handful of managers. And so that that's when you have to sort of really be relevant to them and do a lot of work that's not necessarily um, going to lead to an allocation. You need to be out there doing thought leadership papers and and just help them make sense of what's possible. Because, you know, there's, there's this thing about we would like the following strategy. And then you have to then take it back to reality and say, right, well, what is actually possible with these constraints? So, Razvan... That, that's what we you, will continue to do. You're pushing the envelope on all these things. I know that you talked about alternative data. Um, we're in the quant world. The big word is machine learning. I know we've always, and certainly we have always used tools that are just statistical tools that are called machine learning. Now, the other tools that are legitimate, you know, machine learning tools as one would see them in the public eye. How are you guys managing that word and those, um, you know, the possible future discoveries that that um, that arm of science can give you? So again, that's that's an area that has been it's become fashionable to, to talk about uh, of late. Um, as you rightly said, it's you know machine learning is, is is a set of statistical techniques that you 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 put together to explain a lot of non generally non linear effects, right? Things that we use utilize these these techniques at the firm but we remain the one big thing that we want to be able to maintain is interpretability of those results um, we are quite you know you can learn things through machine learning techniques you can learn about how certain assets predict other assets but we need to start with Again, ideas that you know, you've sort of data sets that you know have predicted, you've already extracted information from those data sets. Like you know they have value. It's more than just a fit. And then you can utilize machine learning to quite quickly give you insights that are maybe some hidden relationships, some nonlinear relationships. And then we can decide, okay, well, how can you actually safely harvest that information? So we do. We do have sort of active machine learning models that are um, that we trade them in some of our strategies. Uh, we utilize them to um, to set sort of like risk budgets or things like that to, to study features about markets. And it will be an area that's great, that's here to stay, right? It, it, it's a, it's a technique to us. To us, it's not you either do machine learning and nothing else. So it, it is one of the many many tools that we have at our disposal to capture repeatable effects. You know, for us, the scientific method is, is what we try to do is, is, is a test. You can, the empirical evidence needs to, to bear fruit, it needs to be falsifiable. And then if things fail, to be able to be removed from our systems. And you only know when things fail if you understand what what, what drives them. So that, that, that to us is a... Um, it's an exciting area because there's a lot of interest in it. So there's a lot of talent out there who 
it's new, some new techniques. We've got more computational power than we've ever had before. So you can test, you can do a lot of experiments. But the thing that actually hits client portfolios needs to be very, very robust. And so we, we, we are making progress there, but I wouldn't say that we, you know, even 50% or even 30% machine learning. You haven't program. done the big plunge. Okay, that's interesting. No, not yet. Great. Well, I think this has been incredibly informative. Um, did we miss any themes that you wanted to cover, Razvan, or do you think we, we hit on most of the important notes? I think, look, it's it's been, we've covered a lot of ground, um, and uh, I think lessons from last year, a little bit of what's on the horizon from our point of view. It's, you know, it's as much as I'm comfortable to, to forecast. I, I, I really, really um, uh, shudder when I, when I have to make predictions about what we think is going to happen next. So, so I think I've done enough um, <laughs> fortune telling uh, to not to be held to, uh, to account. Excellent. I agree. But, Razvan, well, thanks so much for uh, your for time and joining sharing us and, and uh, your insights. Yeah. You know, we, we met a couple of months ago and I found we were part of a panel and I found you uh, the most insightful and I'm glad that we were able to get you on the podcast because you have not disappointed. Hopefully we can have you on again sometime soon. Definitely. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure and um, look forward to uh, speaking again soon.